out there know that we're about to begin? Um, they're going to have to go down to see the slides. Level three, probably on the lights. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Woo. We are so, so, so glad to have all of you with us, both those of you online and those of you here in person tonight for our presentation as part of our Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. And um, many of you in person got a chance to see some of the moon rocks on, courtesy of Johnson Space Center Astronomical uh, Astromaterials Research Exploration Science. So we're really, really delighted they were able to join us tonight. We are going to hear about Apollo, Apollo 16 and 17, as well as the Apollo missions in general tonight. Um, wanted to let you know that we do have other presentations coming up as well. So if you don't already receive emails from LPI, you might want to subscribe. We'd love to have you. Um, and there'll be time for question and answer after the talk. So we'll have the talk and then Q&A and then some chance to sit around and talk. Let's go ahead and... And please uh, help me welcome our director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute, Dr. Lisa Gaddis, who's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, it's wonderful to be here in person again, isn't it? We're, we're thrilled to be hosting visitors like yourselves for events like this. Um, so it's, um, as Christine said, welcome to our Cosmic Exploration Speaker Series. It's my very enormous pleasure to uh, introduce tonight uh, Dr. Walter Kiefer of the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, Walter's educational background includes a Bachelor of Science in 1984 in Physics and Astronomy from Texas Christian in Fort Worth, a Master of Science in 1986 in Planetary Science from Cal. California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, and a PhD in 1990 in physical, phys, planetary science and geophysics from Caltech as well. After that, he uh, had a term from 1990 to 1993 as, uh, thank you, uh, uh, as a National Research Associate, um, National Research Council Associate at Goddard Space Flight Center. And after that, he came to the LPI and has become, over time, a senior staff scientist and our associate director. Um, Walter's research interests at the LPI include internal structure and thermal evolution of terrestrial planets and large icy satellites. Um, Walter is um, 
very busy working on numerous planetary missions for NASA. He's a co-investigator of the Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, and Imaging, the so-called Da Vinci mission that you've probably heard of, which will explore Venus uh, in the late 2020s, 2020s as part of NASA's discovery mission, discovery program. Walter's also a co-investigator on the Vensar Radar Science Team on the European Space Agency's mission called Envision. Uh, which is an oral remote sensing mission um, to Venus launching in the early 2030s. Um, he's recently selected to be the U.S. mission scientist of Envision, and he's a co-investigator on the gravity and radio science team for Europa Clipper, so a very busy fellow for the next uh, many, many years. And as you've heard already, Walter will be talking to us about Apollo 16 and 17 tonight. Thank you, Walter. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's, it's really nice to be back in person to be doing these again. I remember standing in this room on July 20th of 2019, giving a talk about the um, 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. And we're now three years past that. It seems time has really flown. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, talking in this case about Apollo 16 and 17. Uh, we're focusing on those uh, because they were the last two missions of Apollo. They were the two missions that flew in 1972. So this is the 50th anniversary of those two. Um, the last one, Apollo 17, launched, um, if you reckon it by Houston time, it launched very late on December 6th. Most people will record it as very early on December 7th. Um, and it, it landed on, it came back to Earth on December the 19th. So we really are very close to the 50th anniversary of the end. Um, and my intent today is to give a retrospective, not just about those two missions, but really how we did geology on the moon. Um, this is meant to be a science talk. I will try and explain why, why we did certain things or why the crews did certain things. Um, but but I, I wanna, I, there's a lot about Apollo that I, I don't have time to cover. I'm not gonna talk about the details of the spacecraft, for instance, um, but I will give you a context of the, um, what went on uh, before, um, for, for all six of the landings. Um, I won't spend very much time on the first three because it's just a context for what happened um, on the later, the last three missions. The last three missions in particular um, were truly science rich um, and we learned an awful lot about the moon and I'd like to give you an understanding of why that is and what we learned. So, um, and I'm going to avoid using a, um, a laser pointer in this room because the folks that are watching this online don't get to see that. So I'm hoping that my verbal descriptions are good enough and forgive me if they're not. Um, this picture of the full moon on the left shows the locations of the six Apollo landing sites. Um, the, uh, the last two, the ones we'll focus on tonight um, are highlighted. The red star is Apollo 16. The uh, yellow star is Apollo 17. Uh, let me start by observing a little bit of science here. There are two basic colors on this image. There's this very dark gray to black, and then there's a, a, a lighter gray to kind of almost white. Um, they represent two different kinds of rock, two fundamentally different types of rock. Um, the darker stuff is basalt, which is very common on the earth. Um, the lighter stuff is an orthocyte, which does occur on the Earth, but is not that common. Um, and we will talk about samples of both of those as we go on. Um, you'll notice that the, um, the darker areas are often in circular structures. Um, think about where the Apollo 15 is, where Apollo 17 is. Um, the, the, the darker material is in, arranged in largely in circular deposits. Those are impact basins. They are large holes in the moon that were create, uh, created when um, impactors, sometimes perhaps 100 kilometers across, hit the moon and made these large basins. Um, and we'll talk again about that as we go along. Um, the other thing, the other point I'd like to make here is the, um, the picture on the right shows um, an older area on the moon. And so scientists knew already even before Apollo, that there was a range of ages because the areas that have a lot of craters, um, the, these holes in the ground, are, um, are older. And then there are places with many fewer and they're, they're younger. Um, and so we already knew there were a range of ages. Um, and, and we can, again, we'll talk about that as we go. So 
Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 were really, especially Apollo 11, really was simply about landing on the moon, getting out, picking up a rock, and coming safely home. I mean, that was, that was the commitment that President Kennedy made, landing a man safely on the moon and returning him back to the Earth um, by the end of 1969. Um, and it was enough of a challenge from an engineering perspective simply to do that. Um, the crew of Apollo 11, um, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, weren't allowed to get more than about 50 to 100 feet away from the spacecraft pretty much at any point. There was one time, and I'll show you that later, um, where they did, or Armstrong at least, got further away than that. Um, I'll show you that later, but they were really restricted to a very close proximity to the spacecraft, um, 50 feet most of the time. Um, that's not good. <laughs> Um, I'm going to keep talking in the hope that um, our tech people can clear that quickly. Um, the picture on the right is um, a picture of uh, Pete Conrad, the commander of Apollo 12. Um, Apollo, Apollo 11 landed about four miles off target. That caused a great deal of consternation. They, they didn't know where they were going. Um, they ended up landing in a place that was not as safe as they hoped it would be. Um, and they wanted to they wanted to prove on Apollo 12 that they could land very accurately so that they could then target more difficult landing sites for the rest of the uh, missions. Um, the way they chose to do that is they chose to land next to You've lost us. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm go I'm going to try and keep talking while uh, while they fix this. Um, on Apollo 12, they wanted to prove that they could land very accurately. We had landed spacecraft on the moon, um, uh, unmanned robotic spacecraft, um, as precursors um, to bring back information, um, and they chose land to, to land next to one. And you can see the lunar module in the background. Um, <laughs> right, we can. I promise you it's there. Um, and, and on Apollo 12, they walked um, and they were, um, uh, so you can see where they are. I mean, that's the lunar module in the background. Um, they're a couple of football fields away at this point, giving um, the distance. And they, they did a, a little walking tour, um, but they didn't ever get much more than two to three football fields away from, um, from home home base, such as it were. Um, so by Apollo 14, they were willing to, um, they knew they could land safely. They picked a more challenging location and they let the crew draw, walk a little bit further away. They let them walk close to a mile, um, which was really the limits of what you could do in that spacesuit. Um, they were walking from the, the arrow there on the lower right, lower left, that points out where the spacecraft landed, they wanted to get up to that crater at the top. Um, they chose that particular crater because deposits from one of those large impact basins is strewn over this area, and they wanted that material. Um, it, would, it would let them determine when that impact happened, the Imbrium Basin impact uh, occurred. But the thing is, you can't just go land and say, we'll pick it up, because, you know, in the almost 4 billion years since that happened, the, um, there's been a lot of churning on the ground. So the actual surface is not that original material anymore, but you pick a young crater like Cone Crater there, um, and it then sprays stuff from below the ground. Um, in this case, given the size of the crater, it's probably spraying things from 60 to 80 meters, so 200 to 250 feet below the ground. Um, and so they were able to pick up rocks, and this is an example of the rocks right near the rim of the crater. Um, that, that were ejected out. And these are thought to date the impact of the Imbrium base and that large circle on the left side of the moon. If you think of the eye of the man in the moon, that's the one you're thinking about. Um, and that was now dated because of these rocks at 3.93 billion years ago, which is remarkably precise, but I think is quite, quite likely the right number. But just as an example of how hard this was, well, two examples, they, how do you carry equipment around? Um, they, 
they had a little um, cart that they were supposed to pull with them. And it had two wheels and they were supposed to carry all of their tools and bring back all of their rocks on it. And it turned out to be very rickety. The, room, the moon surface is very rugged. Um, and basically it was so difficult to pull that at some point they picked it up and they just walked carrying it. At one point, mission control begged them to just leave it and keep going. Um, the other problem was that they could not, they, they, they weren't sure exactly where they were because the, the surface is going up and down and up and down and all these rocks. They are at this point only about 20 or 30 feet from the rim of that big crater and they never saw it. Not their fault, they tried really hard until they got to the point where, where mission control said, you gotta go back, you're gonna run out of oxygen. And they had to go back to their spacecraft. And we've taken pictures later. So this is a picture from Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been orbiting, uh, NASA's had orbiting the moon since 2009. It's got a really slick camera system on it. One of my colleagues works on that mission. Um, and they took this picture and all of those little arrows point to the tracks where you can actually see where they went. Um, it's not each footprint, but as they scuffed up, they made a darker trail. Um, and they knew actually from, from pictures even that they took on Apollo 14, they figured out about a couple of weeks after they got back how close they were, but this picture proved it. Um, and everybody was like, oh God, we were that close. Um, and I really feel for the guys that, that were that close to looking into that crater and didn't get to, but. It, it makes the point that they needed something more than just walking. So the last three missions, as I said, were very science rich. Um, NASA, NASA always has to have a name. Um, these were the J-class missions. Um, I don't have time to explain how that came about. There was a good logical reason for it, but just trust me, let's, let's just go with it. Um, the, the last three missions, Apollo 15, 16, and 17, had three great advantages over the previous missions. First, they had done an upgrade to the lunar module. So instead of staying for a day and a half and having two four hour long moon walks, they could stay for three full days and have three seven hour long moon walks. Uh, that's, that's a great advantage. Um, the second advantage is they also were able to carry a lunar rover. Um, think of a little dune buggy in effect, um, powered by batteries um, and engines on each wheel to make it fairly mobile on difficult terrain. Um, this means that they could get, go much farther. Um, it meant that they could climb up more rugged terrain. It had a navigation system, so it was harder to get lost. Once they figured out, once they had a place where they identified, they knew where they were, but when they landed, they knew where they were at a specific thing, and they could correlate on their existing maps exactly where they needed to go. And mission control could say, go to these coordinates and you'll be where you need to be. Um, they had a camera, a television camera on there that was controlled by mission control, so the folks the scientists in what they called the back room could keep track of what they were doing and provide additional input to them. And then they had this rack on the back where they could carry more tools, carry the rocks to come back. Lots of advantages. The third great advantage that they had was that they, because they were not developing techniques for landing on the moon anymore, that had become, I don't know if you could call it routine. I don't know that landing on the moon would ever feel routine to me. I would love to do it even once and I'm never gonna get that chance. Um, but it was something that they knew they could do. So they were able to spend more time training to do geology. And on the last three missions, they, they took between 15 and 18 field trips each per crew, um, sometimes for many times for three days at a time. They would go to different places to, to learn about different kinds of rock that they might see. They would do their training in backpacks like they would wear on the moon. So they got used to doing the real circumstances. Um, and this turned out to be a huge benefit to them when they got there because things didn't always go the way they planned. Um, all of the missions, all six of the landings deployed uh, a various sets of experiments on the surface. Um, what I happen to show here is a seismometer, which was used to detect moonquakes, but also it's a great tool for determining the structure of the moon. So um, you, you'd, you'd measure the speed at which earthquake or moonquake waves travel through the moon and you can infer the type of rock and how thick is the crust? Is there a mantle? Is there an iron rich core? And the answer is yes, there is an iron rich core. So we actually learned that from Apollo. Um, but then the last three missions also carried a lot of experiments on the um, command and service module. So we're looking at the, the little um, gumdrop shaped structure at the bottom is the command module where the crew stayed. 
Um, this is a picture taken from the lunar module looking back at the command module. And then there, there's that big open bay where they carried a lot of experiments, um, a large fraction of which were a pair of very big cameras. This is the 19, early 1970s. I think you might suspect that the cameras were closely related to things we might have had looking at the Soviet Union at the time, but probably not as good because we probably didn't want to give away the, the exact capabilities of our spy satellites. But that kind of capability, and they brought that back, that film back. They also carried chemical composition sensors. On this mission on Apollo 17, they had a radar that could see down into the ground, and you can see that antenna up there sticking away from it. Um, so they did a lot of different things, and I could give you a whole talk about this. In fact, I was supposed to give a whole talk about this just after the pandemic started, and I never got to give that talk. Um, but, but this is a different talk, and I'm, giving, I'm talking about the, the geology now. Um, so the last three missions, let's talk about each of them. And, and even though Apollo, 7, Apollo 15 is not in its 50th anniversary year, we're gonna start with it anyway, at least briefly. Um, the picture on the left is um, an overhead view of the landing site. The red and white triangle is where they landed. The um, relatively smooth dark material is the Mari plane. Mari is the, the um, astronomer geologist word for for what turns out to be lava planes on the moon. Um, the, the sinuous structure just to the left of the triangle is something called Hadley Rill that turns out to be a lava channel. Um, lava flow, lava flowed through that at one point as a liquid. We'll see it from the ground in a moment. Um, so there were two objectives. One was to, um, to collect basaltic rocks, volcanic rocks from the Rill and the Mari Plains uh, because this is a different location from where they'd been before. Um, and then the, the more rugged material is part of the rim of this basin, the Imbrium Basin. It was produced, as I said, when something large hit the moon um, and it pushed up this rim. And so the expectation was that deep crustal material was uplifted during this impact and it would be exposed near the surface. So things that might have been 30 kilometers below the ground, 30 kilometers, 20 miles down below the ground that you would have never gotten to, nature has brought to the surface so that we can collect. Um, and so that's why they went there. Um, so this is, this is a picture of Hadley Rill um, at the landing site. You can see one of the astronauts with the rover. Um, it looks like you might drive into that. You might think, were, were they ever tempted? And I think the answer is no, they were not. Um, the Rill is at the type of place, at the location of the landing site, it's about 1.5 kilometers or a mile across. Um, it's about 300 meters deep, so a little bit more than three football, football fields stacked on top of each other. Um, and the slope was about 25 degrees, which is probably more than the rover could have handled. They certainly weren't going to trust it. Um, it turned out the rover was pretty good at climbing, but it's much better to try and climb up things so that if you have a problem, you can slide back downhill, as opposed to going down into something. And if you have a problem, you don't get to climb back up. So they didn't go down into something like this. It was, never, it was a, a no-go. Um, they brought back rocks from here. Um, almost all of, the, all of these rocks have numbers. And I, I fear to tell you that there are a lot of us in this field that know these rocks by numbers. And if you had asked me, you said, well, what is 15016, Walter? And I would have said, it's the seat belt basalt because that's, most of them don't have names. They're just known by numbers. And a lot of us can quote a lot of numbers. Um, sad, sad but true. Um, these are basalts. These are like the rocks that come up, for example, in Hawaii. The dark rocks at volcanoes in Hawaii, for instance, are basalt. It's a very common kind of volcanic rock on the earth. These all turn out to be 3.3 billion years old. Um, the one at the top is called Great Scott for two reasons. One is Dave Scott, the mission commander, collected it. And it is the second biggest rock ever collected. It was 9.6 kilograms, so figure a little over 20 pounds. Because of its size and because of who collected it, it got nicknamed Great Scott. But, but if you're gonna talk about it in a paper, you've gotta call it 15555. And usually you've gotta define it in terms of subpieces. So you might have commas and additional numbers after that. Um, the one at the bottom has a more interesting story. Um, it was not at one of their sampling locations. As they were driving along, um, they drove, they were dri driving by it and Dave Scott, the commander driving the rover, saw it, recognized that it was unusual looking and I'll explain the unusual in a minute. And he knew that if he had asked mission control, he would not be given permission to pick it up. He wasn't gonna let that stop him. 
Um, these crews, of course, were all military pilots with the exception of, the, of Jack Schmidt, the geologist on Apollo 17. They were all military officers, very well trained, very well disciplined. They understood following orders. They also understood when sometimes it was good to be creative in interpreting your orders and not asking permission. Um, so I'm guessing he thought this out in advance. I don't think he figured this out on the fly. I don't know that. Um, I only met him once and I didn't get to ask him that question. Um, but my guess is he thought this out in advance and he stopped and mission control is following. And they can tell that the, the, the engine's not progressing anymore, that there are no more RPMs on the, on the electric motors. So his, his, um, his lunar module pilot says, okay, Houston, we stopped temporarily. And before Houston could say what's going on, um, Scott says, I had to stop to adjust my seatbelt. And indeed he did. He adjusted it off. He got out of the rover. He was stepped over, picked it up, handed it to his partner, sat back in the rover and adjusted the seatbelt back on and said, okay, it's fixed. <laughs> NASA had no idea what happened until they got back and they were um, looking through the rocks in um, the sample lab at JSC. And uh, they said, this one's not in a numbered bag and there's no record of it in the mission transcript. What happens? And, and Scott said, well, this is a bonus rock. Remember when I stopped to adjust my seatbelt? That's how it got its name. Um, but again, if you're gonna write about it in a paper, you've gotta call it 15016. Um, the thing that makes this unusual is you can see all the little holes in that rock. Okay, holes in the rock is not very scientific. So what geologists would call those vesicles, um, big science word, um, and I don't expect you to remember it, but that's what we, we would call it. Um, and it indicates that there was some kind of gas in this rock when it formed. It, it made bubbles. Um, of course, then the rock solidified, the gas escaped. There's none of it left there, so we can't tell you precisely, but best guess is it's probably carbon monoxide or maybe carbon dioxide. Um, don't really know for sure, but there, there was places where there was gas inside the moon. Um, this happens a lot on the Earth, not so much on the moon, um, but hold that thought. We'll come back to it when we get to Apollo 17. Um, and the last thing from Apollo 15 that I'd like to show you is a rock from the basin rim. Um, and so you're looking back at the hills um, that are to the south of the landing site. They drove up into them. The hills that they flew over to land were as much as four and a half kilometers high. So that's about three miles, 15,000 feet. So, you know, if you're flying in an airplane and you're at 15,000 feet coming into bush, you're coming into land, but it's half the altitude you would typically be flying at. Um, these mountains are not quite that high. And they only got maybe a hundred or so meters up. Think of again, the height of a football field. Um, but they're climbing a slope of 10 or 15 degrees. It was steep enough that it was a little difficult to work around, but this is a place where they were expecting some of the rocks that got pulled up from the deep under the ground. And in fact, they were rewarded. Um, and so this is one example. Um, this rock is, there's two pieces to this rock. The lighter colored material is called norite. Um, it's a type of volcanic rock that we believe formed deep inside the moon's crust, probably 10 or more kilometers down below the surface. Um, uh, it's part of what we call the magma ocean. And I'll talk more about the magma ocean probably in under Apollo 16. Um, and then the darker materials, what we call impact melt. Um, when something that big hits the moon, and this, this impact basin is 1,100 kilometers across, it's bigger than the state of Texas. I didn't know it was possible to be bigger than the state of Texas, but apparently it is. Um, the, the thing it hit was 50 or 100 kilometers across a lot, and it was moving at, I don't know, 10 or 15 kilometers a second. There's a lot of energy there because the two things come crashing together and stop all of a sudden. A lot of rock got melted. Um, and so this is material that was melted in that impact um, and it helps to date the, uh, the, the age of this impact basin. I still think that the date I gave you from Apollo 14 is probably a little bit more precise for this area, but, but we have melt from here too. Um, and they got the two things that they were looking for. The two major objectives from Apollo 15 were completely achieved. Um, there was some concern, could they land safely there? And Dave Scott, the pilot said, look, you tell me where you wanna go. 
let me worry about landing it, no problem. These were really good pilots too. Um, so then Apollo 16, um, they had two objectives at this point. They wanted to get to, um, this was the, the landing site that landed on the, um, uh, in the lighter terrain on the moon. This is what we call the lunar highlands. It's the, it's the higher and rougher part of the moon. So they wanted that crust um, and they were hoping to get samples of what they thought might be ancient lunar volcanism, older than any of the uh, basaltic rocks they had collected up until that point. Um, and so they had this picture um, or pictures like it. Um, and, and they actually landed at, at the point uh, where the arrow was pointing. That was the landing site. Um, and there are two main terrains around here. First, you can see there are a lot of impact craters, all of those circular things. This is an older area of the moon. That's, that's very clear, we knew that. Um, the smoother area was called the Cayley Formation or the Cayley Plains because they thought it was relatively flat. Um, that was their first mistake. Um, uh, and they thought it would be volcanic um, because it was relatively smooth. They thought it either would be lava flows or maybe an ash deposit something got exploded out of, a, out of a volcano and then kind of float along the surface. Um, and then the, the stuff to the south of the landing site or below the landing site was called the Descartes Formation. Um, it's rougher. The interpretation there is that it was probably something like a rhyolite dome. Now we have examples of this on the earth. Um, rhyolite is um, compositionally, it's the same as the granite that you like to have that so many people, the pink rock that you like to put on your, your kitchen counters. Um, now, not everything that's called granite when they sell you rock to go on your counters really is granite. My wife came home and said, um, look, we're getting this nice black granite. And I said, mm, it's a pretty rock and it truly is. I love it. I don't want her to think bad about me when she hears this on the video. But, but there are things that you see that tile people will tell you is granite and it's not always. Um, but the pink stuff is granite, big pink crystals. That's really granite. Um, rhyolite is... Um, uh, a surface rock, it makes very rough domal, domal structures. It's got more silicon in it than, than basalt does. Um, and so they thought that might be what it was. And they picked a place where they could actually go up on one of these. So let's see what happened. So as he's stepping onto the surface, John Young, the commander, um, says, um, there, this is the equivalent of Neil Armstrong's One Small Step for Man. This is as he steps onto the plains onto, the, onto the, the ground. He says, there you are, mysterious and unknown Descartes, Cayley Plains. Apollo 16 is going to change your image. And boy, was that true in ways he had no idea what was coming. Um, because as things go on, none of the rocks they found that first day looked anything like what we're expecting. Um, well, so a few hours later, um, when they get back in um, to the lunar module, um, the command module pilot who's been flying up above and not getting to listen to much of this, um, asked how it went. And um, mission control told him, well, none of the rocks are what they thought they were gonna be. And that's when Ken Mattingly says, well, it's back to the drawing board or wherever it is geologists go. Um, this was the mission where everything turned out different than they thought. Now, the good thing is that these, as I said, these crews were really, really well-trained. Um, mission control, the, the crew knew that even though this was not what they were expecting to find, they knew their descriptions were right. They knew that they were not finding what they were told to find. Mission control, the scientists in the back room, knew they were well enough trained that they believed them. Um, if this had happened on Apollo 12, say, they would have thought they were getting bad descriptions, but they knew this crew was telling them the right stuff. Um, and, and even though it was a completely, ch completely changed mission, they knew that they would go on and keep doing the sample collecting that they were trained to do and everything worked out fine. You just had to interpret the data differently. So, so let me show you three examples. The first one actually worked out really well. Um, actually it was a sample of sometimes you have to just be lucky. Um, we knew going back to the first, to Apollo 11, that these very white rocks called the Northocyte were special. Um, the very first lunar science conference, it was called the Apollo 11 Lunar Science Conference. Um, we still have them. We just finished our 53rd, I think, Lisa, 53rd. Um, we have them every year. The very first one, there were people talking about these things and describing what eventually became called the magma ocean, that the moon melted early on. And the crews were, the crews were very well trained to look for these white rocks 
Um, and they commented when they landed on Apollo 16, they looked out the window and said, there's a couple of really white rocks out there that we're gonna have to pick up. And so they did. Um, they drove right up to it. Um, and this one turns out to be 60025 at a north of site. It's 4.36 billion years old. This is younger than we, because the moon is about 4.5 billion years old, we think. So, and this, this age is more uh, of a recent re-estimate of it, a redetermination. Um, we're now puzzling over how did the moon stay so hot for so long or what exactly happened? There are still mysteries that we're still figuring out from Apollo. Um, but um, this, is, this is something that we think what happened is there was enough energy when the moon formed, probably something hitting the earth and throwing material out that much of the moon was melted. And as it solidified, some things went up, some things went down. The stuff at the end that floated to the top was just the north of site. Um, and this is an example of why we call it a magma ocean. This, is, this was first figured out from Apollo 11, but this sample and one like it on Apollo 16 were the very best examples we had of it. So they, they were doing two other things. As I told you, they had two other units they wanted to go to. Um, they wanted to go to one of these mountains, which turned out to be called Stone Mountain. It's in the background behind um, the lunar module, and that's John Young. And if it looks a little weird the way he's saluting the flag, it's because he's three feet in the air. He was just a little exuberant here. And if you look down, you'll see he's not attached to his shadow. Um, and he's not Peter Pan. Um, so he's jumping, if you see that in the, in the, in the video. And so his crewmate um, timed it to get him at the, at the top of his jump. Um, this is uh, uh, this mountain is about a third of a mile high. They got uh, 150 meters up it um, on a 20 degree slope or something like that. It was near the limit of what they could climb with the rover. Um, so they got maybe a third of the way to the top um, and there are no, no rhyolites up there. In fact, it's this, what they would call a fine grain impact melt gotcha. Okay, um, uh, this is rock that was melted at some point in one of these big impacts. And um, let, me, let me explain where it came from maybe after I do this next slide. Um, the next day they drove north to a crater called North Ray Crater. There were two craters, young craters that produced rays scattered over the terrain. And so creatively the one to the north of the landing site was North Ray Crater. And the one to the south, can you guess? South Ray Crater, um, and, and it works, and we still call them by those names. Um, they didn't actually get to go to South Ray Crater. It was too far away, but they did go right up to the rim of North Ray Crater. Um, it's such a big place that the pictures from the ground don't do it justice. This is an orbital picture, again, taken by Lunar Orbiter, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, looking down into it, this is about a kilometer across, um, a kilometer, so about six-tenths of a mile, um, and it, the, the stuff from the base, it's about 240 meters deep, uh, two and a half football fields, and the stuff from the bottom comes up and gets deposited on the rim. There's a rock there, which I don't have a good picture of, um, called House Rock. It's about 20 meters across and 12 meters high, and they, they looked at it and said, this rock is the size of a house. Um, there's a slightly smaller rock next to it. It became known as Outhouse Rock. Um, but they brought back rocks from this. And so this, um, this is the, what's now a fragmental impact breccia. Again, it's formed by an impact process, not so much melting, um, but a lot of things beaten up and then fused back together. Um, one of my geology professors years ago taught me the right word for this. And if there are any kids in the audience, you can tell your teacher that I told you this term, this rock is all boogered up. Um, and it's the right way to remember it because well, it is. Um, and, um, so there are two very different kinds of rocks here. Um, probably one of them is impact debris from the Imbrium Basin. What we argue about is whether both sets of rocks come from Imbrium or whether one came from a different one. And I'm on the side that says we got a twofer. We got samples of two different basins at one place. Not everybody agrees with me. And so one of the lessons is scientists can disagree. It's an okay part of science. We, we fight rather vigorously, in fact, um, but that's okay. Um, and so there are some things we don't know with certainty. Um, so um, going on, Apollo 17, the last of these, um, they had two more objectives here. Um, this was a landing site that was not planned um, until Apollo 15 flew over this area. Um, and they looked down and they said, 
there is something that looks like a young volcanic vent. Um, and so NASA decided it would be good to look at it. And we'll see that in a moment. Um, and again, this is the basin. This is a, this is a valley called the taurus Littrow Valley because it's the Taurus Mountains and it's near Littrow Crater. And so sometimes that's how the naming goes. Um, they landed in the relatively smooth part on the floor um, and they went um, south to what's called South Massif and north to what's called North Massif because these are things that got pushed up um, in the basin impact that formed the Sharonitatis Basin. So I showed you Imbrium and the one next to it on the right in the Man of the Moon um, is Sharonitatis. Um, and again, they wanted to get ancient highland crust that had been pulled up, um, in this case, far from the Imbrium impact. And they mostly got what they wanted this time, not entirely. Um, so this is a comparison of how far they went on the two missions, um, Apollo 11 and Apollo 17. Remember I told you they only got 50 feet away from the lunar module. Um, this is the activity to scale on a major league baseball field. So the distance, you know, um, lunar modules about at shortstop and, um, you know, they got as far as way, you know, to the, to the, to the bottom there as, as first base. So, you know, the distance a good major league baseball player can easily throw, throw a baseball is how far they were allowed to walk. There was one point they had, they had flown over a small crater that Armstrong saw as he was landing. Um, Aldrin didn't get to see it, by the way. Um, the lunar module pilot didn't pilot anything. They controlled the computer. And so he was telling them um, the readings on how high they were and how fast they're coming down. The lunar module pilots never saw anything until they got on the ground. But Armstrong had seen it and he thought, you know, I wanna go get a picture of that, but I wanna rock from that. Now, do you think mission control was gonna let him get out of the side of the TV camera? This is the first landing, of course not. What did I say about Dave Scott? Neil Armstrong was a very good military officer too. So he exerted his um, curiosity and his creativity and he went sneaking over there without asking anybody. And before they missed him, he was back. So that's the stuff that's out in the, out in the center field. That's as far as they got away. Um, uh, and you know, he was, you know, if he had been in a hurry, he could have been back at the front of the, at the lander at, um, at the ladder in 10 seconds, 30 seconds, something like that. By the time you get to Apollo 17, they are now walking on, um, they, they, they're taking three EVAs, driving around. Um, this is a picture of Manhattan Island in New York City to give you a scale, that central park in the middle of it. Um, so it's a fair piece of New York City. They're driving around a lot. They drove 22 miles total. Um, but for, for those of you that are here in Houston, the, the the, the red part at the lower lower left, think about that being at Reliant Stadium, um, just inside the 610 loop, and put the stuff at the upper right in the corner of the east loop and the north loop. You know, So it's all of the inside loop of, of the city of Houston. It's, that's what they covered. Um, and they, they got to, the rovers really were a big thing. So uh, a few pictures of, the, a few examples of the, um, of the rocks they brought back. Um, Let's start with the, um, the, the supposed um, young volcanics. This is an orbital picture of that crater, Shorty Crater. Um, you can see that dark stuff is what got them really excited because that, that was interpreted as volcanic ash. Um, it's a small crater about the size of a football field. Craters that small don't last very long on the moon. So they knew it was a young crater. And if they interpreted it as a volcanic vent, that meant the volcanism had to be young too might've only been a couple hundred million years old. Well, they went there and this is where um, Jack Schmidt scuffing his feet along um, comes back and says, hey, this is orange soil. So they um, immediately start taking samples of that. They bring it back, they did it in the lab and it's not young, it's 3.6 billion years old. What happened here was this was not a volcanic crater. It was a, a simple impact crater that happened to hit where an old volcanic deposit had formed billions of years before. But they recognized it from uh, orbit, went there, we've got the rocks and we figured it out. Um, on their way back from, from, that, uh, from that, they stopped another crater called Camelot Crater. Um, this is now about 600 meters across. Um, this is close to seven football fields. Um, it brings up material from at least 120 meters in the ground, below the ground, so 370 feet. Um, uh, a nice way down. Um, 
And so this is a way of getting, again, getting rocks that were not right at the surface. We use natural drill holes um, in effect. And this is an example, it's a gabbro. Well, I told you basalt before, basalts and gabbros are basically the same rock compositionally. It's just that basalt is very fine grained. It's something that erupts on the surface, cools very quickly. You get very fine crystals, very small crystals. Um, in fact, sometimes they're so fine that even with a good hand lens and you're a geologist in the field, you can't actually see the individual minerals. You, you make slides and you look at it under a microscope. This is big enough where it's, it's buried, it formed at depth. It's because it had a blanket of material over it, it takes longer to, to cool off. Um, and so it's, it, it makes bigger crystals. And so we call that a gabbro rather than a basalt, but they're basically the same rock. 3.8 billion years old. This is 500 million years older than the stuff I showed you at Apollo 15. The same kind of material, but 500 million years older. So the moon was active for a long time. Um, they also went to find um, the impact rocks. This is from the North Massif. As I said, this was pushed up in the impact that formed the Shronicotis Basin. Um, I think this is the one, this is perhaps in my mind, the most dramatic picture of all of Apollo is Jack Schmidt working there at that boulder. Um, they knew about the boulder in advance. They specifically went to that location. There are pictures that show a track where this rolled down a third of the way down the, the hill. Um, it's about 80 meters off the ground, but it started up like five or 600 meters higher than that. It's about a third of the way to the top. Um, the top is probably about a mile up. Um, no way you could have driven to it, um, but you let things come down to them. So they were very clever in picking their landing sites, pick sites that would tell them things like this. And this is again, one of these melt rocks um, it's, uh, and this is 3.93 billion years old. Now, have we seen this number before? Oh yeah, we saw this at Apollo 14. Um, we went here hoping we would get an age of the Serenitatis impact, and maybe we did. This is again, something we argued about. And although I wasn't here for the meeting, we had a bunch of people in this room a week ago having this argument yet again. Um, the, um, I think, and some other people think that this is actually part of the Imbrium Basin that sprayed things over. The mountains came up from Shrenitatis, but then Imbrium next to it sprayed stuff out. And just like it sprayed it to Apollo 14, it probably sprayed it here. And we may not have a good date for the Shrenitatis. We may have to go to other places, except maybe we do because of great good luck. Um, because sometimes you didn't actually hammer on the rocks, you, you collected little samples out of the soil, which we call regolith. And this is Jack Schmidt using what they called a rake. And the idea was you sift it through the soil and you collect all the little pebble sized things in there. Um, the big rocks get excluded, the soil falls out and you get a collection of pebbles that you bring back. And the idea for doing that is that you have something that's representative of the whole area around it, not just the rocks you happen to hammer off of the boulders. And this was the great discovery at one of these locations, actually there at the same place where the boulder was. It's called a troctolite, 76535, and it's, other people have called it, and I think they're right, the prettiest rock ever to come back from the moon. It's a mixture of plagioclase, this light stuff like the anorthosite, and olivine. The, the green is like peridot, um, it's a magnesium olivine. This is again, a sample from the lunar magma ocean. It formed about 4.4 billion years ago, but because it started to solidify at like 50 kilometers down, it took a long time to solidify. And we know from a way of dating it that this got brought to the surface at 4.2 billion years ago, all of a sudden from 50 kilometers all the way to the surface. So that sounds like the impact that made Apollo 17, made, made, it, made the Imbrian Basin, excuse me, the Shrenitatis Basin, let me get the right basin here. Um, there's another one of these rocks, another one of these norite rocks at a different Apollo 17 landing site, which I haven't, or sampling site, which I haven't shown you, that also got brought up from maybe 20 kilometers down at the same time. So I think these rocks are telling us when Serenitatis formed. Now, why do I care? Well, either way, the Imbrian Basin is nearly, is the nearly the youngest basin on the moon. So a lot of things happened by 3.9 billion years ago. A lot of impacts were hitting the moon. And why do we care on earth? Because the earth was getting hit by all of the same things too. Um, so the early history of the earth is not present in earth geology now. 
but it is recorded on the moon because the moon hasn't been weathered in the same way. So either these two impacts happened almost at the same time, so you've got a real, bomb, real bombardment, or they were spread out over a few hundred million years, and we don't quite know that, and it has different consequences. Um, but understanding that is something we would really like to understand because it expects the early Earth. And so I hope when we get to go back um, with people, we will go to multiple places. Um, and this is one of the things we can try and figure out. Um, the, um, the Artemis program that's going to launch, we hope, the first unmanned mission on November 14th is mostly going to go to the South Pole because that's where they think water ice is. And that would be a resource. And I think that's important. I hope personally that they will go to other places too because there's a lot of geology to be done. So let me summarize the moon at the end of Apollo. Um, and this is my last slide. Um, just as the basic things that we knew, um, if you take away the bullet points, these are the things I've tried to say to you tonight. Um, beyond the fact that they were very creative in how they, how they picked their landing sites and such, which is true. But the science facts, um, like Earth, moon differentiated. It separated out into different kinds of rock. The heavy iron went to the center, made what we call the core. The, the um, silicate rock stayed in the interior, that's called mantle. And the parts that melted from the mantle came to the top and that's called the crust. We have this on Earth as well. Um, the moon's crust preserves in things like the anorthosites evidence of a magma ocean very early in lunar history. Almost certainly the Earth went through the same phase. It's hard to imagine that we did not, but the Earth doesn't have that record anymore. So this is again, why do we go to the moon? Because in part, because it tells us something about the Earth and the Earth's earliest history. We know the moon experienced an extended period of heavy impact bombardment early in its history. We don't know precisely what the timing was. And I hope, as I said, I hope we get to go back and do that. And this is one that you probably can't work out with robots. I think you actually have to have crew um, carefully collecting samples. And then we know that the moon had a very extensive volcanic eruption period based on Apollo between 4.2 and 3.0 billion years ago. The moon formation is about 4.5 billion years ago. We, we have places that we're pretty sure happened at one point um, between two and 1.5 billion years and some disputed areas that are younger. But the moon was active for a long time. And the people who hoped before Apollo that they would get a body that had no geology happened to it, it would be the earliest rocks in the solar system. They, they, they didn't get that. We have meteorites for that, but the moon records a part of history that's not on the earth anymore. And that's why it's important to us. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I will take some questions um, and I will let Christine and uh, Grace control that. And can hear us so that those who are watching online can hear us. We want to make sure that the questions are into the microphone, please. So, um, got a question over here first. Oh, um, I don't remember the name of the rock, but uh, vestules or something, the bubbles coming out. Vesicles. Vesicles. Yeah. Um, how do you know there wasn't gas inside of the rock? Well, or did it, was it just completely porous? Um, Thank you. Well, so there was gas in the magma when it came up, and as it starts to solidify, you get solid material, and then you get these bubbles that are held there and until it solidifies. Eventually, the gas escapes because it's had a long time in a place where there is no atmosphere. Um, but the, the gas had to be in the magma originally, um, and then the rock solidified around it. That's what, make, that's what makes the holes, like Swiss cheats, kind of. How uh, how far into the Artemis program will they start to do more lunar geology? So so the Artemis plan is that the first mission that launches, um, we hope in a week and a half, will be um, without crew. The second mission um, will have crew on it, but they will go into lunar orbit. Um, there will be a test, an uncrewed test of the landing system. Um, and then the fourth total mission, but which will be called Artemis III, um, is when they hope to land near the South Pole. And you will, they, they will stay for a number of days. I'm not sure the actual number 
And at this point, I'm not sure that they're going to have a rover. They may be limited to walking. I'm not 100% certain of that. But they'll, they'll have a number of days out on the surface. So they'll start doing geology immediately. They'll start putting out um, experiment packages. Um, and right now, NASA has plans for at least Artemis 3 and 4. Artemis 4, I think they've just now decided, will be a lander. They were thinking it might just be an orbiter. Um, but, but we're now talking to 2027 or 2028. And beyond that, um, you're making projections based on what gets appropriated, what NASA's budget looks like. And nobody in their right mind projects that far out um, with any sense of, of certainty. So that's the hope. Um, but you know, it will depend on what Congress wants to do. Um, in 2027 and 2028. You have to plan far enough in advance to build your equipment. So you can't start, you can't say, well, we're gonna go next month. Well, you're not gonna have your rocket. Um, but but plans might easily change between now and then. But it, you know, I hope I say 2026 or 2027, we'll have crew on the ground um, and, and they will start doing geology on the very first moon launch. How are the ages determined? Good question. Um, how are the ages determined? Um, there are radioactive elements in these rocks. Um, uh, uranium and thorium are examples that you probably have all heard of, but there are other things um, like uh, rubidium or um, neodymium. Um, no, samarium, not neodymium, sorry. Um, that decay at known rates. Um, and so you measure the what's called the parent product, the radioactive elements with a mass spectrometer, a fancy big e equipment that, uh, that measures not just the element, but the particular flavor of the element based on how many neutrons are in it. Um, and then you measure how much of the material that it makes, what's called the daughter product. And you know the rate at which one form goes to the other. And so you can then say how long it's been since, um, since the rock solidified. And different systems are useful for different things. They have different age ranges. They form and they, they work better on different kinds of rocks. Um, but we have multiple ways of doing that. And that's the basic method of doing it. No, it was a... <clears throat> so I have a couple questions and they're pretty basic just because I don't have as good of an understanding of this stuff. But you were mentioning when like the moon is getting impacted and it's getting those craters it's bringing up material from like many 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 miles down so i'm just wondering how does that if the crater isn't many 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 miles down how is the material from that far down coming up so okay that's a very good question so the the ones that bring things up from that deep are these very big impacts that formed a long time ago that made these basins that are a thousand kilometers across and that really does excavate down tens of kilometers. It actually digs a hole that's that big initially, but it melts all of that material and it eventually comes back together, but it throws stuff out from, from the bottom of this hole initially. Um, and, and the best way you can figure that out is actually we have computers that are capable of making those models. Um, and then before you say, do I believe the models? You actually then go look at the rocks and say, do the predictions of the models match what I see in the rocks? And the answer is they do which gives you confidence in the, 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 um, the models. And you can actually look in some cases at the details of the minerals in the rock and different kinds of minerals are stable under different conditions. And sometimes they're stable under very high pressures. And so if you find something that wanted to form at say 30 kilometers down and the pressure is associated with that, but it's now at the surface, you know it didn't form at the surface, you know it formed 30 or 40 miles down. So it's a combination of things. It's the size of the crater, it's the computer models, it's the details of the rock, all of which tell you a consistent story. Now, the, the, the smaller craters that they walked up to that I showed you a couple examples of, the Northray Crater at Apollo 16 or Camelot Crater at Apollo 17, these are a few hundred meters across and 100 or 200 meters deep. And so they were only bringing stuff up from you know, a couple hundred meters down, a couple of football fields. But the deep rocks are coming from these very large impacts that only happened early in the solar system, 3.9 or 4 or 4.2 billion years ago. They don't happen anymore. There aren't those kinds of things hitting anywhere anymore. But the smaller ones are still happening. Um, and, and we take advantage of that too. 
I was also wondering, you mentioned that if the moon was getting uh, impacted so long ago that the earth probably was too, but I don't usually, or I don't know of any craters on earth. So I was wondering how you know that the earth got hit too. Well, so there are craters on the earth and the easiest one you can find if you go to the Grand Canyon um, in Arizona, on your way there, there's a place called Meteor Crater or Behringer Crater. It's um, about a half mile across, give or take. I don't remember the exact size. Um, it's formed, it formed about 50,000 years ago when something, a piece of iron, an iron meteorite, um, and they've got the meteorite or parts of the meteorite on display there at the visitor station. Um, uh, something about the size of a school bus or maybe a couple of school buses across hit and made this hole in the ground. And there are other craters like that on the earth. Um, some of them are highly eroded because they're old, um, but there are a bunch of them. There are probably a hundred or more of these that are recognized on the earth. But you know that's compared to literally millions of them on the moon because the, the moon doesn't have the weather the earth has. It doesn't have rain. Um, it doesn't have wind. It doesn't have all of the things that cause things to erode. Um, so there's a lot more on the moon that's preserved is the point. Um, but but the, the earth definitely had been, has been hit many times. And we, under, we first understood this process by mapping things. Actually, it's the crater, truly Meteor Crater in Arizona was the place that people figured it out. Um, and they argued about it for years because there were people said, no, that's got to be a volcano because nobody could imagine that there was that. Um, but turns out it is an impact crater. It does have the kinds of rock that are indicative of um, impacts, but are not indicative of melting in uh, a volcano. I've lost track, but somebody somebody over here that has. Yes, I. <laughs> right here, sir. Yes, I was uh, in Istanbul during this mission, and uh, I see a picture on the on the newspaper of an astronaut lying flat on the floor of the moon. And I was uh, very concerned. It was Harrison Schmidt. He had the fallen. Oh, and, fallen, uh, yes. Yes, so sir. he was face down. Yes, there were. Yes, it um, was very disturbing. And um, um, I understand he fell next to a crater that is now dubbed uh, Ballet Crater, because when he was falling, he was flying back and forth. And, uh, and I understand that the rock that was taken next to this was put in a box and not used for 50 years, that only very recently, this year actually, it was reopened. So is this true and what did you find? Okay, so let me let me take out two parts of that. First about all of the astronauts fell, every one of them. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, you're, you're working in a, in a spacesuit that's the equivalent of a pressurized balloon. Um, you're in gravity you're not used to, you're on a rough surface. Um, they all fell, every one of them multiple times, they all got filthy dirty. Um, um, the particular instance you're referring to, um, there's the video of that. Um, and uh, Jack um, is vocally expressing his frustration, shall we say. And, and all mission control, all the commentator could say is Jack Schmidt having a little problem, <laughs> kind of words that you're not supposed to say on television. Um, but what were you gonna do? Um, um, so I, I don't know the specifics about that rock, but I will tell you there are a set of rocks that were set aside deliberately. Um, to get a moon rock to study, you have to go through an allocation process. You've got to tell NASA why you want to do what you're going to do, why you want to do it, why it's important, and then they judge it. They make a decision about whether they're going to give it to you or not, and you're not always successful. I've written lots of such proposals. And sometimes they said, sure, we'll give this to you. And other times they laughed and said, no, I don't think so, Walter. Um, and that's fine. I mean, you, had to have, you have to have good reasons. You can't just say, I want to do this because working with moon rocks is cool. Now, moon, working with moon rocks is cool. Um, and, and every day I spent in the lunar lab was a day I cherish. Um, but that's not a reason for getting to do it. Um, but they set aside a set of rocks aside. Um, to wait for improvements in the technology. Um, and a set of those were, they started working on in 2019 um, for a program that's been called ANGSA, which is Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis. And I told you there's a meeting here in this room last week. Part of it was a public meeting and part of it was 
the team talking about its results, but they were actually in this room talking about it just a week ago. I wasn't there. I don't know the specifics about that rock, so I can't tell you what did they find. But they set aside a number of things that were important. Um, one of the core samples they brought back, I think they froze just to make sure if there was anything that got preserved. Um, and I look, I don't know the things. I can't keep track of every every study that comes out in planetary science, so I, I don't know the answer to it. But it's absolutely true that they set aside a certain number of things, and they just announced another set of samples that will be available for a second such program where people are starting to write proposals to now. Um, so this is an ongoing thing. They're making advantage of the fact that that technology has advanced enormously since since then. I, I came into this field in the early 1980s. Um, I very nearly got to work with one of the pieces of equipment from 1972 um, that would have been used on this kind of stuff, except it died out from under me um, just as I arrived at the um, at Columbia University um, in 1983. Um, but but equipment is just so much better now. The electronics, you can see finer things, you can make better measurements. Um, just because of the better electronics. And so it makes sense that they're now starting to look at some of this. And it was, in this case, it was caught, tied to the fact that we were getting ready for the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Um, and I, there are probably other rocks that haven't been looked at yet. And we may do another one when we get to 75 years or something. I don't really know. I will not be around for that one, I don't think. Um, I'd be delighted if I am, but I won't be doing science then. Um, but that's why they did it, okay? Um, I hear. Yeah. Thanks, Walter. Uh, two quick questions. One is uh, there's lava tubes on the moon and lava tubes in Hawaii, but the Hawaii lava tubes have the dome, the form that's soda straw. And I was curious why Hadley Real never had a dome over it. And then secondly, I may remember it wrong or remember it incorrectly about on the Shanger mission on the far side, there was some I want to say there was some speculation about impacts on the far side causing magma displacement into the near side. Um, I was wondering if I remembered that wrong or if you could comment on that. Um, okay, so lava tubes first. There are a lot of these rills on the moon that are open. Um, why? I'm not sure I can tell you. Um, it may simply have been that these things, the material was moving fast enough that it, it never let it settle down at the top, um, but there are other places where they are truly closed off tubes and we can see, we know that because we can see sky holes. We can see holes going into the ground um, in high resolution pictures um, and we actually can detect them with gravity. I was part of the GRAIL mission um, that measured the gravity of the moon to exquisite precision. And in places where we know there are these tubes, we can actually see the drop in the gravity because there's less rock. And we see similar signatures in some other places that tell us these are probably lava tubes. Um, but there's also a lot of these open channels and we call them rills. And there's, it's not a one-off thing. There are, there are enough, there's an atlas of them. Um, now, Chang'e, I, that's another one that I have not had the time to follow that much. Um, I will say if they were talking about impacts a lot, well, I'm not even sure I'd believe it if they, if they were talking about impacts early in the history of the solar system that you drove magma from one side to the other. Certainly not the kinds of impacts that are happening today would not be driving magma across the moon. That just does make no physics sense to me today. Um, and that doesn't mean they didn't say it. Um, and it's another example of scientists are going to willingly and openly debate. And I bring to the table physics skills that make me think, I don't think that's possible. Um, and they're going to have to show me good evidence. And I just don't know that evidence. So I can't definitively say they're wrong. I'm just going to tell you, I find it unlikely. And I think you've got one more. Thank you for your talk, Walter. Um, as a lunar scientist, what do you say to those people from a scientific perspective that we never went to the moon? With your God. Because I keep running into them at airports and other places. <laughs> so... So first, I will tell you the, one of the one of the great things of first we didn't go to the moon for science. I mean that's the first thing that's very clear. We went to beat the Russians. Um, but I will tell you that the best thing we got out of the Apollo program is not the knowledge about the moon, which is fabulous, but what we got out of it is a generation of scientists 
who are committed to studying science in general. Um, this is a story I told in this room, standing at this podium on July 20th of 2019, where I said to people that it's in fact not true that everybody was watching um, the landing on the moon. Of course, of course, there was no pictures of the landing on the moon when they're actually landing the lunar module when Armstrong's landing, but they had the radio thing. Um, and I said, it's not true that everybody was watching on on television because I said, I know for a certainty that there was a nine-year-old boy sitting at a campsite in Northeast Texas, listening on his dad's battery powered transistor radio. And then later that night, pestering his parents to stay up and listen to the moonwalk and keeping up all night long. I still own the radio. We have a generation of scientists who got turned on not just to geology or planetary science or astronomy, but to science in general that were inspired by those landings. Um, the people that flew them will tell you that the kick in the pants, you couldn't simulate, you couldn't make, a, you couldn't fake any possible way. Now, okay, you might say that if you don't wanna believe it, you'll say they're lying. But the fact is that these rocks are just different enough chemically that they're not like the earth. Um, the basalt, and let me just take an, so to two examples. I told you the anorthosite from the Highland crust there are places like that on the Earth, but not a lot. It's all over the place on the moon. Um, and then the basalts. Um, first of all, they have very little evidence of water in them, whereas it's almost impossible to avoid having water in basalts on the Earth. Go to Hawaii, you make basalts at those volcanoes. How do you avoid getting them wet? You, you can't. The biggest place we make basalts on the earth is on the bottom of the seafloor. How do you avoid getting them wet? But the lunar rocks, almost no evidence of water in them. And then one other chemistry piece about it, the, the biggest way we distinguish the different types of basalts um, from the moon, we, we classify them based on, first of all, based on the element titanium. And so um, we call them high titanium and low titanium. And I promise you that if you told a terrestrial petrologist that this is a, that they, that the, um, what the titanium content of a low titanium rock on the moon is, they would look at you and go, that's enormous amounts of titanium. It doesn't happen that way on the earth. So there are differences. The, the, the two bodies have subtly different compositions. Um, you can't fake the ages. We don't have rocks that are that old on the earth. And yeah, the guy in the street is going to say, well, how do I know the data? But, you know, enough different people are studying these things in enough different labs that you can't not do these side checks. So, so we know because the rocks tell us they were on a different place other than the Earth. Is that enough of an answer? Okay. Well, satisfy well uh, okay, you know, I... I, I have to talk as a scientist. You know, I if you're a skeptic in this country, um, uh, don't get me started on on that. And, and you know, there's also this thing called the greenhouse effect, and it's real. Um, and and again, there are people that don't want to believe it because they just don't want to believe authorities. But I have to live as a scientist and live with the data, what the data is telling me. Um, and the data is telling me that these are things from a place that's not like the Earth. Um, and in very, very clear ways, it's not the earth. And we got them back somehow. And I watched them. Um, and I watched them and, you know, how, you know, we talked about uh, Jack Schmidt at Ballet Crater. Is that something he could have practiced? Probably not. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, it's just not something you could have done. Um, the, uh, it's people working in a different gravity field. The, the pictures, I think, tell you too that it's different than the Earth. Um, and if you don't want to believe it, you don't want to believe it. I can't force you to. But that's the evidence is in the data they brought back. Well, yeah, and and that's a good enough reason for me, Lisa. But um, um, I got to tell a Jack Schmidt story. Um, 
while we're there, and I'm, forgive me if I'm running the time over, um, but uh, on the Japanese sent a spacecraft to, um, Jack Schmidt, of course, was the, uh, the um, lunar module pilot on Apollo 17, the last landing, the only non-pilot to land on the moon. Um, uh, got his undergraduate degree at Caltech, um, PhD from Harvard, um, and uh, you know he he got a chance, and he's uh, he's a really bright guy. Um, he learned to fly jets and to fly helicopters in order to qualify to do this. Um, and he lands there. And anyway, years later, the Japanese sent a spacecraft to the moon called Kaguya. And one of the experiments they included on there was an, a high definition television camera which was massive. And we all looked at each other like, what the heck are these people thinking? Well, after they come back, they, they re released a, a video disc of some of the pictures and you can find small versions of these on, on YouTube now, but seeing them in full scale on an HD television is, is the right way to see them. And we were, at that point, we were still meeting, our Lunar Science Conference was still meeting at South Shore Harbor in League City. Um, and in the lobby, we had set up um, a television where we were playing these. Um, they kept, the Japanese kept a security guard there to keep anybody from stealing the disc. Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm mesmerized by this. And, and I realized I've missed like three talks that I was intending to go see because I'm just watching thing after thing after thing. And then there's this guy standing next to me and I hadn't, wasn't paying attention to was there. And then he says, it's the only thing I've ever seen that looked like what I saw from the command module. And I looked over and it was Jack. Um, now I've known Jack for a while. I, it's not like I get to interact with him a lot, but, um, but I have had that privilege and I've met a few of the other astronauts along the way. But um, yeah, I mean, so yes, if Jack said he did it, well, he did it. Um, but, but, you know, for the skeptics, you know, there's data and you're getting data from literally thousands of scientists um, who it's science is a self-correcting process. Um, and people do sometimes get things wrong in science. I, like I said, you know, what they thought they were gonna find in Apollo 16 is not what they found. Um, science is a self-correcting process. And so um, eventually the truth is going to come out and these measurements by group after group after group says these are not like earth rocks. The processes are familiar. The details are different, and they're different in ways that reflect the differences between the Earth and the Moon. That's how we know we went to a place that's not on Earth. That's how we know we went to the Moon and brought rocks back. Good enough? That's good. Yeah, I had some bonuses there. That was a great. Okay, so I think the plan is we're going to go out. There is a light reception out there. I will be out there. I'll mingle. Um, I will answer additional questions. Although, share me, please. There's a lot of you, and I'd like to get around to to various people. So, so don't. If you're the first one that gets me, you do have to give me up. Okay. <laughs> and eventually, my wife wants me to come home, where she's going to say, "What did you say about our granite top, anyway, Walter?" <laughs> so, for those of you online, we're so glad that you were able to join us. We're we're going to go ahead and end the the live stream now. For those of you here in person, uh, please enjoy the mingling in the great room, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon in the next month or two. We went on. How long did we do for questions? Oh, an extra 15 minutes. Well, I.